Hello there, and welcome to the Good Old Days of Radio Show. This is John Tifteller, your host. We are at the conclusion of a special series of 10 podcasts. Yep, 10 of them we did, featuring special guest from down under in the great country of Australia, Mr. Keith Scott, the man of a thousand voices, and a gigantic expert on cartoon voices, vintage radio shows, and all kinds of things entertainment-related from those good old days. Author of the book, Cartoon Voices of the Golden Age, 1930 to 1970, a just all-around great guy who knows more than I do about cartoons and vintage radio shows. So um, it's been great having you on these episodes. And today well, it's we... it's been most enjoyable. Yeah. Hello again, Keith Scott. Today hey we... There. <laughs> hey there. It's Yogi Bear. Um, today we have an episode of Command Performance. Now, uh, I guess I'll, since I do all the talking when I have no guests, since you're here, tell everybody what Command Performance was, because people who grew up in the golden age of radio, if they are still breathing and still listening to this podcast, you never heard Command Performance. You had no idea what this show was, but if you um, right. if you were in the armed forces, you did. So explain that, yes. Keith. Well, it, once once America officially went to war in December of forty one, the armed forces, uh, uh, you know, um, formed their radio division because radio was the prime communication. This is way before the television era. In fact, TV had been held up because of World War II. The development of television was put on hold, and radio was king throughout the war years. So very early on in the piece, in early nineteen forty two. The Armed Forces Radio Service was uh, inaugurated and and based mostly in Hollywood, where a lot of professionals who had been drafted, including actors like Elliot Lewis, Howard Duff, who played Sam Spade, uh, Jerry Hausner was very, very uh, instrumental in this. All of these guys were given the task of what they called denaturing these famous radio shows to be played for service personnel overseas as a morale uh, boost. And denaturing really meant, it's a kind of a, a strange industry term that meant in a very interesting way, be way before the advent of recording tape, which w would have made this task a lot easier, they had to take existing radio shows and remove the commercials and anything that was deemed potentially maybe a little dangerous by the enemy and just have the entertainment portions only. And uh, this, um, I don't even technically know how they did this. Uh, I've read about it, but uh, I don't really have a technical mind. But they got it down to a fine art where they, sometimes it seems seamless when you listen to these shows that there ever were original commercials and network announcements in it, because they've all disappeared. But the great entertainment content uh, was retained. However, the big thing that the Armed Forces Radio Service did was their original productions, which were never heard in the USA, but they were intended specifically for morale raising, and command performance was their crown jewel because it was the um, the biggest of the variety shows. And uh, what this was was they would get a Hollywood guest or a musical guest as the host of each week, a different one each week, and um, they would specify requests from service personnel flung far across the whole world. And these requests would come in that they would like so-and-so to appear in a funny skit or they would like a, a show just dedicated to, um, you know, one of the uh, sexy gals of the time like Betty Grable, who ended up hosting quite a few. And then the rest of the show was filled with variety turns, such as uh, people like Mel Blanc, who would play uh, um, a radio version of the famous Armed Forces comic strip, Private Sad Sack, which he did in his Porky Pig voice. And just, you know, lots of comedians and lots of great musicians, and particularly the heavyweights of the industry would appear on this show uh, gratis, such as uh, Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra, all the, all the people who were gigantic at the time just did this for the war effort. So this was an amazingly... Uh, 
flexible series that went for like seven full years. It, it, it extended beyond the war years. And fortunately, most of these shows have survived as a, an amazing historical pinpoint of what the era was like. Uh, they really do, um, in some ways, kind of define uh, the, the mood of wartime and, and the sense of escapism that so many people sought to get away from the gloom of the fact that uh, this world war was raging. So that's kind of a, a summation of Command Performance USA uh, as, as and a full in case, title. And in case anybody missed it, you did say this, but I want to emphasize it. None of these big names that appeared on this program got paid. Every right. one of them did it for free as a contribution to the war effort and to the entertainment of the soldiers overseas. And they never, right. ever allowed these to be broadcast in the United States because, well, many reasons, but one of them was because they were not paying these big stars. They were doing it all for free, and all kinds of union rules and contracts and whatever would have had to have been written, established, and to, to do this kind of show in the United States of America would have required a lot of things yes. that, that didn't have to happen when they were doing it strictly for the Armed Forces Radio Service. But yes. in going through seven years of these broadcasts, and I've heard a lot of them, I haven't heard all of them, but I've heard a lot of them, um, you get top-notch writing, top-notch performances, and all kinds of fun stuff that you just would have never gotten listening to the radio in the United States of America. But if you were a right. soldier or in the, in the armed forces in some way, a Marine, anything, the transcription discs of this show were sent overseas, and they were played on the Army bases, they were played on local radio, in, in various outposts that were near Army bases. They did everything they could to bring Hollywood and bring entertainment to the poor soldiers who were having to be miserable fighting the war. So it, it's yeah. a real interesting series. And there were a couple others, one called Mail Call, I think, and, and I forget what the other one was, but uh, there, there were a couple others that did this, but Command Performance was the big show, so to speak. And we have yes, for great. today a Command Performance that is loaded, chock full of cartoon voices and cartoon-related things. Tell us a little bit about it, and then we'll play it. Well, this was one of these ones where uh, the show had been on for a couple of years. This is like uh, the, the date of this one will be May the 3rd, 1945. So we're already almost uh, at victory in Europe. The war is coming to an end. And uh, they'd had so many shows, including one of those classics that you played once on this series, uh, the Dick Tracy in B-flat, which was one of the most famous of them all, you know, with... Bing Crosby, Sinatra, Judy Garland, uh, all of these huge stars, Bob Hope, did this crazy skit. And so they were getting wilder with some of their creativity. And on this one, they had had some requests from some of the um, service personnel that they missed seeing some of the old theatrical cartoons that were part of all the old movie programs in those days in, in theaters. And so they requested maybe uh, some of our favorite cartoon characters could appear on an episode of Command Performance. So what happens, they drag out uh, the people who did the voices for these characters, Mel Blanc, who was already appearing on the thing as a sad sack, as I mentioned. Um, Mel Blanc did uh, his famous Bugs Bunny, and I think Porky Pig as well. And they had Arthur Q. Bryan come in as, you know, the famous um, little scared hunter, Elmer Fudd. Oh, I'm hunting, I'm hunting a wabbit. <laughs> And then from Disney Studios, they got uh, Donald Duck and Goofy to appear. And believe it or not, even one of Disney's more obscure cartoon characters, they got this um, strange lady called Florence Gill who, who could imitate hens. And uh, she was Dame Clara Cluck, the Barnyard Nightingale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an and, obscure uh, Disney cartoon for you. I don't know oh, that those yeah. are available. <laughs> are those available out there? I don't know. Well, I think, so. I think she, she appeared in a couple of uh, the old Silly Symphonies, and there was one Mickey cartoon where they, uh, they the, were in a concert hall, and she was singing, singing opera in a, in a crazy uh, hen's voice. And so uh, all of these characters, and then 
For some unknown reason, the famous announcer Harry Von Zell also appears in this to sing the Cowardly Lion song from The Wizard of Oz. I guess oh, they felt that's that that was bizarre. Okay, it is bizarre. It's it's kind of a, a, a fantasy element, I suppose, that felt cartoony. So uh, that was again part of the uh, thing on this show. But it's pretty much just. Uh, uh, anything goes in the world of animation on radio. Um, so this well, is, this a is uh, perfect the final w- version of what we've been talking yeah, about for 10 per- weeks, and this is perfect actual way. cartoon characters. Perfect yeah. way to close out your appearances for now on the good old days of radio show. Um, right. All kinds of cartoon voices. Okay, so everybody, uh, put your imagination caps on. Get ready to imagine Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny and all these great characters as they appear for you on this radio program never heard in the United States of America until now and maybe (laughs) maybe somewhere else, but not back then anyway. May 3rd, 1945, Armed Forces Radio Service Worldwide, Command Performance. USA, the greatest entertainers in America, is requested by you, the men and women in the United States Armed Forces throughout the world. Command performance presented this week and every week till it's over, over there. Hello, man. This is Ken Carpenter bidding you welcome to another all request program which stems from your letters to Command Performance Armed Forces Radio Service, Los Angeles, USA. Uh, We've been on the air for three years, and we thought we were doing a pretty fair job of answering your requests. But this week, we received a burning letter forwarded to us by a supply sergeant that made us realize we've been overlooking a large section of our listening audience. Here, I'll read it. Dear Command Performance, I am an Army mule stationed in the ETO. Uh, Speaking for my colleagues, the dogs of the Canine Corps, the Carrier Pigeon Squadrons, the horses of the Cavalry Divisions, and a few nondescript mongrel mascots with a footnote from a flea on a camel's back in Iran, we'd uh, like to remind you that we're in this war, too. So how about giving us animals a plug on command performance? Signed, Lucius B. Mule, PFC. (laughs) Better known as the sad jackass. (laughs) Well, no request is too big or too small or too unusual, so tonight the program is going to the dogs or anything else that trots or flies past the microphone. All right, who's first? Why, it's Donald Duck! <laughs> well, say, I'm glad you're here, Donald. I saw your picture, the three caballeros. So where are the other two guys? Oh, well, 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 outside. <laughs> outside, huh? Well, uh, bring them in. Well, well, fresh from Mexico, that explosive little rooster with the charro sombrero and the oversized gun belt... Panchito Pistoles. <laughs> you bofuetes, encantado de estar aquí con ustedes. Me cuadra hacer nuevas conocencias, aunque aquí ya tengo pilas de amigos por vía de... <laughs> Donald, what did he say? Well, thank you, Benchito. Welcome to Command Performance. And now I'll introduce the third member of this trio. That suave, sharp man about Brazil with the body of a parrot and the soul of a poet, Jose Carioca. Senhores e senhoras, salve! Alô, pessoal! Daqui vai um grande abraço bem brasileiro, um daqueles quebra-costela bem apertado, bem carioca. É um prazer estar com vocês novamente, meus amigos norte-americanos, completamente. Vocês são batatais do barulho. Eu fico louco! Uh, can you translate Portuguese, Donald? <laughs> when do we eat? <laughs> well, here they stand, the three caballeros. Sí, señor, los tres caballeros. Si no le hace, echen el gallo más copetón que aquí traigo con qué quererlo. Ah, gentle little fellow. What did he say this time? 
<laughs> well, if he won't talk, maybe he'll sing. How about you and Jose Carioca and Panchito Pistola singing the title song of your picture, The Three Caballeros? Okay, what's that? A couple Los echaron los tres caballeros y nadie se iguala a nosotros. Ay, 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 ay. Felices amigos, siempre vamos juntos. Donde va el primero, va siempre nosotros. What means ay caramba? Oh yes, I don't know. Oh, to bear a stormy weather. Let's bear it. Like boats on a shell. Maybe the sound of the baby says yes, no, or maybe. We spend it on each off to a fine start, and we hope all the ducks and roosters and parrots at APO 512 are listening in. And now we turn to our next guest. Well, who's there? Oh, come in, Sergeant. Now, uh, look, who are you? Well, I'm, uh, I'm Goofy Horse Collar. <laughs> I thought you were up in the Aleutians with the cavalry pulling a garbage wagon. <laughs> oh, nope, I got my discharge. <laughs> oh, you're discharged, huh? Yeah, oh, uh, yeah. I was carrying so many fat corporals on my back, oh, I got flat hoofs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how'd you like army life, Goofy? Oh, it was okay, but I got so lonesome, they finally teamed me up with an old gray mare. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Mayor, huh? Boy, you must have liked that. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, the old gray mare ain't what she used to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, would you like to hear me play the clarinet? The clarinet? Well, sure. Major Wilson and the band are all tuned up to render the William Tell Overture by Rossini. Oh, the William Tell Overture. <laughs> well, I can. they can just go ahead and play their William Tell all they want to, but I'm going to lean back here with my old corny clarinet, and I'm going to toot out some of the good old-fashioned music to suit myself. Hit her. the next time she comes around. Thank you. 
Sophie the horse. If I ever see you at Santa Anita Racetrack, I hope you beat some of those Crosby nags. And uh, speaking of animals, which is all we're doing tonight, let's not forget the famous carrot-munching rabbit of the screen. Hey, what's up, Doc? Bugs Bunny! <laughs> Bugs, I'm glad you could get here, but I don't think there's enough seats for your family, too. Oh, I didn't bring my family, Doc. Just my wife, Josephine. Well, uh, what's all those baby rabbits doing behind you? Oh, dear, Josephine's done it again. <laughs> here, Doc, have a thousand cigars. <laughs> a thousand cigars? There aren't that many rabbit babies. <laughs> You're not as young, brother. <laughs> you know, Bugs... <laughs> Bugs, I sure get a kick out of all those carrots you consume on the screen. You're always eating carrots. Oh, you mean like this, Doc? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the way I mean. Yeah, I thought so. Hey, but you want to know something? You know how I really feel about carrots? Oh. <laughs> Gosh, you sure have your troubles. No, oh, that ain't the half of it. You know, every Easter they expect us rabbits to show up with a basket of eggs. Yeah, don't people know that's a little out of our line? Oh, but... Bugs, <laughs> <laughs> think of the happiness you give of those eggs. I'm sure it's worth every effort you put into it. Well, all I know is, uh, I don't see how the hens can do it every day in the year. <laughs> well, tell me, Bugs, you have any trouble getting here tonight? Well, to tell you the truth, Doc, I did have a little trouble. See, I was loping through those woods around Griffith Park. And, brother, is that a place to lope? Anyway, I suddenly heard a voice say... Wave your paws above your head and don't take a step or you're a dead whap. Uh-oh, that hunted guy again. I got you now, Wabbit. You got away from me lots of times before, but to tell you is wicked. <laughs> you don't say wicked, huh? Yeah, my wife is pressing white against your foey back. Hey, listen, Doc. Scratch it a little, will you? There's <laughs> one place there I can never reach. I'm gonna press the trigger. Have you any last words? Yeah. You see this fist of mine? Yep. <laughs> Come on, chase me. Here I go. You can't get away from me. Come back here, Wabbit. Where can he be? I, I thought sure he was hiding in this bush. Me, yeah. you looking for somebody, Doc? Yep. <laughs> yes, I am. Did you see a wabbit go by here? Oh, wait, was he a big wabbit with his ears piled high up on his head? <laughs> yeah, that's him. Where was he? I don't know, but I'll give you a hint. All right. Now, uh, put your head over here. Uh-huh. Look straight ahead. All right. And about six inches in front of your nose, you'll see something. Yeah? Yeah, I see it. What is it? It's me! <laughs> now I got your wabbit. I'm going to shoot you. Oh, please don't. No, no. You can't do that. I'm not worth sh shooting. Just, just look at my fur. What's the matter with your fur? Stinks, Doc. <laughs> hey, look, I'm too young to die. Think of my home, my wife. What'll become of my 17,000 children? You ain't talking your way out of this one, Wabbit. When I count free, you is just a mess of wet points. Ha-ha. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wetty, one. No. Don't do it. Two. Please. Oui. Me. What's up, Doc? Don't tell me you're still here. Sure. Don't look now, but you forgot your ball ammunition.
we turn the page and we come to another... Hey, excuse me, Ken. Can I interrupt for a minute? Why, Harry Von Zerl! Say, Ken, I heard you were doing an animal show on command performance, and I came over to make sure that my favorite animal didn't get left out. Well, that's swell, Harry, but Lana Turner isn't on the show. (laughs) No, Ken, I didn't mean that. I meant that if you have pigeon listeners and horse listeners, you must have a few lion listeners. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do a great imitation of a lion. You you do? (laughs) Okay, let's hear it. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a lion? Yeah. Sounds more like a disappointed wolf at the Palladium. <laughs> well, Ken, maybe I can tell you better by singing. Oh, huh? a song about a lion? Mm-hmm. Well, go right ahead. Hit it. If I were king of the forest... Not queen, not duke, not prince. My regal robes of the forest would be satin, not cotton, not chill. I'd command each thing, be it fish or fowl, with a whoop and a whoop. And a royal growl. As I click my heel, all the trees would kneel, and the mountains bow, and the bulls cow cow, and the saddle would take wings. <laughs> Why we're king Each rabbit would show respect to me The chipmunks genuflect to me Though my tail would lash I would show compassion For every living thing Why Why we're king Monarch of all I survey Monarch Of all Majesty, if you were king, you would not be afraid of anything. Not nobody, not know how. <laughs> Imposterous. <laughs> I'd thrash him from his top to his bottom. Oh, stop. Oh, supposing you met an elephant. I'd wrap him up in cellophane. Well, what if he were a, b- b- a bronzosaurus? I'd show him who's king of the forest. How? How? Courage. What makes a king out of a slave? Courage. What makes the flag on the mast away? Courage. What makes the elephant charge its tusk in the misty mist or the dusty dust? What makes the muskrat guard his musk? Courage. What makes the sphinx the seventh wonder? Courage. What makes the dawn come up like thunder? Courage. What makes the hot and hot so hot? <laughs> What put the ape in apricot? <laughs> what have they got that I ain't got? Hurry! <laughs> For courage is the king of kings. With courage I'd be king of kings. And the whole year round I'd be hailed and crowned by every living thing.
Thank you, Harry the Lion. Before we go any further here, I have a message from a statue in a park near the Carrier Pigeon Training Station at San Diego. The message is as follows. Dear Pigeons, stop. <laughs> <Let them. laughs> no animal show would be complete without a nice-looking chick on hand. So Command Performance asked the experts for the nicest chick in Hollywood, and here she is, Lena Romine. Tico tico ta ta otra vez aquí, o tico tico ta comiendo mi fruta. Si o tico tico tento que se alimentar, que va a comer o más mi loca no coma. Eh, eh. O tico tico ta ta otra vez aquí, o tico tico ta comiendo mi fruta. Eu sé que el ebe me vino a mi quintal, el ven con mares de canario de pardal. Mas por favor, tire ese bicho de sileiro, porque se acaba comiendo su painteiro. Tire ese tico de la décima de mi fruta, tan tanta fruta que le pude pinica. Eu já fiz tudo para ver se te conseguia Bota ele triste para ver se ele comia Bota aí um gato, mas quando olha mal capão Tico, 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 tchau O tico, 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 tchau Tico, 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 he's a cuckoo in my clock And when he says cuckoo, he knows it's time to woo It's tico time for all the lovers in the block I've got a heavy day, a day, a day, a day. So, Tico, Tico, tell me, is it getting late? If I'm on time, cuckoo, but if I'm late, woo, woo, the one my heart belongs to, minute wants to wait. For every birdie and a birdie who goes nowhere, he knows of every lover's lane and how to go there. For in affairs with the heart, my Tico's terribly smart. He tells me gently, sentimentally, at the stop. Oh, oh, I hear my little Tico, Tico calling. Because the time is right and the shades of night are falling. I love that not so cuckoo cuckoo in the clock. Tico, 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 top. I love that not so cuckoo cuckoo in the clock. Tico, 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 top. Tick tock. Well, Lena, stick around. I want you to uh, meet somebody later. Well, Ken, uh, are there any more animals coming tonight? Well, a letter came in from an Arctic detachment of penguins. You see, it's so cold where they are. They're all laying cold story jags, and every night they almost freeze their flippers off. Like other GIs, they have a favorite movie queen, and they voted this honor to Clara Cluck of Barnyard Symphony fame. <laughs> Selecting her, Miss Pinfeather of 1945. <laughs> well, Clara is here tonight. She's going to sing her famous aria from Il Baccio, Miss Clara Cluck. <laughs>
Thank you, Clara Clark. Thanks for coming over. And when you go, please take those eggs, you. <laughs> <laughs> Say, Ken, who's next on our roll call of wildlife? Well, Lena, I think that just about completes our list. I had... Uh, ho- uh, uh, pardon me, 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 excuse me, 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 me. forgive me for me, but you're breaking into the... Uh, the uh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? Oh, I, I'm an elephant. I'm a hippopotamus. Me, 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 me. I, I'm, I'm a buffalo. I'm, I, I'm an animal. Sad, sad. No, no. I'm, 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 I'm Porky Pig. <laughs> Porky, what are you doing on this army show? You connected with the army in some way? In, 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 no, uh, b- b- but my brother uh, b- is overseas. Oh, your brother's overseas. What's he in? Well, he's in the cavalry. He's in the tank. Uh, c- uh, c- uh, see, he's with the field artillery. Uh, he's in the field artillery. Uh, 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 he's in a can of spam. <laughs> Porky, have you met all the animals here tonight? Oh, it's, it's no fun, uh, just uh, meeting animals. But uh, here's uh, Lena Romai. Well, I, I don't uh, care what her name is. Um, hello, Porky. I think you're cute. <laughs> Gosh, I, 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 I wish uh, I uh, will be... Uh, 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 what do you wish, Porky? I wish I was a man. I wish you was a pig. <laughs> You. Yes, you do? Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, you have such pretty brown eyes. Well, uh, you have a uh, pretty... You have a pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty uh, brown eyes, too? And you have such a nice nose. Oh, well, well you have a nice nose, too. And you have such a cute curl in your tail. Well, you had a cuckoo. My mistake. You know, Parky, I'd like to take you home with me. Eh, hey, you would? Yes. Oh, I, I, I couldn't uh, d- do that. You see, uh, my, my mother would raise a cake. Uh, 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 oh, uh, people would say we were. Uh, 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 it'll it'll cause a lot of. Tr- tr- uh, t- uh. <laughs> well, uh, d- 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 don't stand there. Call a cab. <laughs> well, uh, are you two making out? Oh, just fine, Ken. You know, I was thinking uh, maybe the three of us could go to dinner, and then after dinner, the two of us could go to the movies. Hey, uh, but which two? <laughs> Lena and I. Well, uh, we, uh, we, uh, what about me? You? Who do you think we're going to have for dinner? <laughs> That's all, folks. <laughs> Well, that about finishes off another command performance. I hope all you G.I. animals listening in enjoyed hearing from your favorites. Tonight's roster included Miss Lena Romai as a slick chick, Harry Von Zell as the cowardly lion, Arthur Q. Bryan as the hunter, Mel Blank as Porky Pig and Bugs Bunny, Tenno Kalvig as Goofy Horse Collar and Pluto, Clarence Nash as Donald Duck, Felipe Torres as Panchito Pistolas, Jose Oliveira as Jose Carioca, Florence Gill as Clara Cluck, and Ken Carpenter as uh, Ken Carpenter. Well, I'll see you again next week, gang. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service.
Well, where else would you get to hear a singing chicken and also Harry Von <laughs> Zell singing uh, the Cowardly Lion song? That had to be the most bizarre of all. Um, Harry Von Zell had yep. nothing to do with The Wizard of Oz or the <laughs> anything, but they, <laughs> they had him do this. And the singing chicken, that's right out of a Dr. Demento show or something like that. That was, oh, yeah. that was pretty good. All right. All those great cartoon voices, a cartoon extravaganza. Uh, further comments from you, Keith Scott. Well, that was that was a, a great example of how radio could creatively use the uh, the cartoon characters, and um, it's a it's a great uh, way to end this series of ten that we did relating them to industries because, uh, you know, I keep forgetting to mention that the the big Technicolor theatrical cartoons on a giant theatre screen back in the nineteen forties were as popular as radio shows like Fibber McGee and Molly and the Great Gildersleeve. So it was all contemporaneous, and uh, and you can tell how both industries being based in the town of, uh, well, the environs of Hollywood and Los Angeles uh, were easily able to um, feed each other talent. That uh, really is, is uh, a great way to end this uh, whole thing about uh, cartoon voices being radio actors because uh, all of those people went back to the um, beginnings of radio in the early 1930s. Right. Well, great. Why don't you um, wind up your propaganda machine here for one last <laughs> push for your book? Uh, sure. And tell people sure. about it, and then we'll fade away into the sunset and go watch some cartoons. Well, this is uh, the the reason I was, I guess, invited on, and I was very um, uh, happy to do so because I've had some very nice uh, promotion for the book that I wrote. It took me thirty years of research, but it was it was worth it. It was called it's called Cartoon Voices of the Golden Age, nineteen thirty to seventy, and it covers the history of cartoon voice acting from the beginning of sound films in 1928 when Walt Disney himself was the first famous cartoon voice Mickey Mouse in Steamboat Willie all the way up to the year 1970 when, yes, they were still uh, using radio people uh, with the cut-off point of my book with the movie The Aristocats, the Disney film, which had Phil Harris from the Phil Harris Alice Faye show. He'd become a great cartoon voice a few years earlier as the voice of Baloo in, in Disney's Jungle Book. Well, all of this history can be found in these books that I've written, which are available on bearmanamedia.com or through Amazon and those other uh, outlets. And uh, I want to thank John and uh, Daniel, uh, John Tefteller and Daniel Chase, that is, uh, for giving me this opportunity and for also letting me air all of my love of old-time radio uh, in, in all of its splendor and uh, and range over these last uh, 10 weeks. And it's just been a blast. Well, I want to thank you for the research that went into all of this because I spent much of my earlier years collecting radio transcriptions uh, and I'm surrounded by them <laughs> from where I'm <laughs> speaking in my warehouse here. Right. But I never really did this kind of in-depth research I always hoped that someone else would, and it would be kind right. of my thing to save the recordings and someone else to make sense of it all down the line. So, Well, um, you certainly have done, done more than most for the actual preservation of the recordings and, uh, and with all the years that you were you know, going back to PPB and spurred back. And, uh, and I, think, I think one of the reasons I, I've done all of this research is that uh, you often find uh, people who are in the business of performing are the best ones to research that particular industry because they, they're simpatico with it, they understand all the ins and outs of the actual performance techniques and all of that. And there is that fascination with uh, anything that came before you and was inspirational. Yes, well, very good. Yeah, you were the perfect person to do this book, uh, Cartoon Voices of the Golden Age. And I'm really grateful that it exists and really grateful that you would spend uh, 10 weeks <laughs> with us here on the good old wow. days of radio show. I know we uh, the, the trade secret is we kind of recorded these in, in little segments, so you didn't have to be here for 10 weeks. But uh, anyway, they will <laughs> the listener will hear them over a 10-week period, or yes. once they're yes. all out there, they can binge listen to them all at one time. They, That's right. <laughs> they can go all night long listening to... Uh, 
Keith and myself talking about vintage cartoons and vintage radio and getting into the weeds pretty deep on some of these trivial matters yes. that uh, actually do matter. Uh, and we've now got somebody that's documented them. So I think it's great. I thank you for all the work you did. I know 30 years of research on a book doesn't necessarily result in anything other than self-satisfaction and a few sales yes. here and there. Um, Labor of love, but yeah. and a pretty much a niche, a niche audience, you know. Yeah, <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's not, it's not going to sell like a, like a tell-all about Michael Jackson's love life or something like that. But mm, <laughs> darn, well. <laughs> but the... But then again, that wasn't funny. No. These, these are. No. Um, okay, that's an interesting comparison I will have nightmares <laughs> over. Uh, thank you. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, you did, the, you did the work. You put in your time. You produced a, a, a great book or two here and there along the way. And um, it's just great that all this happened, and it's great to have you on the good old days of radio show. And we look forward to having you again in some other context somewhere down the line. We're at just over 200 right. episodes. And we'll keep on going as long as there are great radio shows, not mediocre ones, great radio shows to uh, bring to a modern audience because that's what we do here on the good old days of radio show. So, Well, thank you very much. That's, that's a, a great cue for me to uh, say that I've enjoyed these 10 episodes enormously and uh, you guys are doing such a great job with this uh, in quality radio, uh, vintage radio. And uh, it's, it remains for me simply to um, say, along with the theme of these ten, that's all, folks. Wow, that's amazing. I was going to actually ask you to do that, and I didn't have to ask you to do that. Well, thank you, Keith Scott, um, from the great country of Australia, the land down under, the man of a thousand voices. Thank you for everything, and thank you to the good old days of radio audience, which keeps growing bigger and bigger as more and more people listen to this podcast and tell their friends and um, bring in more people to learn about the great old uh, shows and how relevant a lot of it is to today's radio. So thanks to Keith Scott for being here, and we'll be back next week with more of the good old days of radio show. ¶¶